All right, we should be live. Now we just need somebody to confirm that we're actually live. So when somebody says, hello, Fraser, then we'll, that's, that's the code word. Actually, I see a bunch of people saying hi, let's see. Uh, we should be live. Oh, wait, maybe not. Is the live stream starting now? Is it happening now? What about now? There we go, it's live. There we go. Someone said hello, Fraser. Now a whole bunch of people are going to say hello to me. Hey, everyone. Uh, how's it going? I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today, uh, host of the Guide to Space, co-host of Astronomy Cast, all the stuff, you know. Uh, tonight, by popular demand, I've got this guy, John Michael Goudier. John. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Man, you... I, after we did the first one with Isaac Arthur and uh, every, and Cody's lab, everyone was like, John Michael Godier next. Huh. So uh, no problem. Good to have you here. Uh, That's good to be here. And uh, people are going to have a whole bunch of questions, but, but okay. okay, so yeah, so there you go. So people are saying that the audio is feedbacking through your mic. Okay, let me put so the headphones on. Here's where he puts on his great big flight headphones. We, we knew this could be a possibility, so if you are hearing echo in the background. <laughs> Isotan says, John Michael Godier, you promised octopus intelligence, and I am here for octopus intelligence. I said it. I promised toast, octopus intelligence, and uh, one other thing. Uh, okay. Uh, Archon Wu, how do I feel about Donald Trump's Space Force proposal? The patrons already know what I think about the Space Force proposal. So uh, the episode will be out tomorrow. Which is that it's already happened. Space Force already exists. You know, and a real Space Force would just be people in beep beep booping on computers. You know, no one's going to space. Uh, so, uh, John, let's go through these then. Oct octopuses and then toast. And then toast, yes. And I think I also talked about exomusks, which are – an exomusk is um, – it's a belt of automobiles that alien billionaires put into the uh, – into orbit of their star in order to energize their civilizations into exploring space. And I, I hypothesized, jokingly, of course, that this could be detectable in a light curve. Well, so hold on. Let me let me understand what you're what you're putting down now. So so you'd have billionaires that would be launching cars, but in this case, it would be the alien versions of like alien billionaires launching alien cars. Yes. And there would be enough of them launched that you could actually detect the light signature, assuming you were lined up to this sort of the, the orbital plane, just like planets. But they would give off a very specific signature. You could say, oh, they've reached Tesla technology. Yes, yes. They're, they're at the Tesla stage of development <laughs> based, well, based on human behavior. Now, is that, John Jogers is saying, is that, you know, depends on the car's color. Is that a color thing or is that a shape of the car thing? I think it would, well, resolution-wise, you could probably only tell that there was a belt of material, sort of like an unnatural ring. Um or maybe like a Dyson Swarm, where you just have so many of them that it just looks like the star is occluded. Well, I've, I've actually seen some research. Some, some astronomers did some calculations that, you know, if you had triangles, they would give off a very specific, or if you had, like, interesting shapes like that, they would give off a very specific signature that you could totally detect. And That would be Luke Arnold, a French astronomer. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I've, oh man, I think we reported on that like maybe eight years ago, I think. Long time ago. I think yeah. the paper came out around 2005. Man, I don't know anyone else who nerds out about Astro PH <laughs> papers like uh, like me. So it's, so it's great to have you here. So for people who don't know who you are, who are you? I am a science fiction author. Um, Is there a way to get your, your microphone thing out of your face? Well... Actually, I could probably get rid of it. You're a because... pop filter, but you really yeah. are. Yeah, I could probably get rid of it. Yeah, Here. let's do that. We're not looking for <laughs> super high quality audio here. Well, I will release it as a podcast, so just you know, try yeah. keep your plosives down. Um, where were we at? Oh yeah, who, I'm a who are you? Is where we yep. are. Where we were. A science fiction author, and in uh, April of 
2016, I thought, well, I need a YouTube channel to maybe promote books. And originally I was going to talk about uh, science fiction. And instead of that, I decided, well, I'm going to talk about science in regards to astrobiology. And at the time, the huge story was KSC 8462852 or Tabby Star, Star, which since has gotten a little bit more boring. But at that time, it was really interesting. And I looked on YouTube and I saw that almost all of the videos that people had done on it were pseudoscientific and bad. So they were hyping it as the alien megastructure. So my idea was to go in and actually explain the science of it and say, not so fast. This could be dust, you know, or could be, you know, whatever, and then go into the possibilities of what it might be. And that started it all. Um, that video sort of went quasi viral. And I thought, well, I'll make more like that. And now I'm getting close to video number 200, I think. Mm hmm. That's and I was I was mentioning that to you before the show that I mean you have in a fairly short period of time gone from YouTube obscurity to quite a significant following mm -hmm. uh, your fans your rabid fans are uh, like they watch every episode many times I can't believe the the number of views that you get on your videos. So the topics that you're choosing are just hitting everybody's hot buttons. Congratulations on that. Yeah, seems to be, but that was not intentional. I just accidentally stumbled <laughs> into that. Yeah. So, uh, so let's talk about the science fiction side of things. So, I mean, sure. how many books do you have out now? Currently two, um, one from 2013 and one from uh, last year. And, um, as I told you before the show, I'm going to be writing a lot more, a lot faster because this is essentially a full-time job for me now. Um, so I'll be focused on videos and content and then also books. Hear that aspiring authors, like take a page from John's book here. I think you've cracked the code. Any aspiring authors copy exactly what I'm doing because it seems to have worked and yeah. it's never been easier to promote your sci-fi. You know, you used to have to rely on your publisher and now you can rely on yourself and um, make a success out of it. Yeah. Now, but has it, has doing the videos almost made you question the being a writer part? You know, not really because given that that channel is scripted content you know i write it beforehand that's writing so um mm -hmm. as long as i'm writing i'm happy well it's, uh, like i do what you do but i don't have the pressure of having to write a book i wouldn't call it pressure because it doesn't feel like work yeah it feels like watching a movie in my head and typing it out um so none of this feels like work to me this is this is a very very fun career as i'm sure you know yeah um, it so. feels it feels like work, but it is fun. Yeah, it is fun. And I'm just as excited about it as I was in uh, 2016. So yeah. I assume I'm going to be motivated to do this for decades. You know? I, I guarantee it. I mean, I've been doing this now for just shy of 20 years, and I'm still as enthusiastic and having as much fun or more fun doing it now. Because I think as you get really experienced at the process where you gain a certain level of mastery. Like, you know, I, I have, I can synthesize all this knowledge and be able to kind of break it down and, and write a script that I feel happy with. Right. And that's a really powerful feeling. And I really enjoy being able to kind of, I enjoy the writing process a lot more now. Yeah. Um, it's, it's same with me. It's same with me. It's just more fun than it ever has been. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so, so we're going to take a bunch of questions from, from the audience. I mean, that's a big part of what we want to do this week, but, um, tell us a bit about the books then. So hold them up. You've got them handy. Well, the first one from 2013 is called the salvagers and it is a, basically a standard space opera. There's not really, it's not a complex story or it's not anything like that. And, um, what I wanted to do with it was I wanted to try and convey a story among realistic physics in a realistic solar system where we haven't left the solar system yet. And um, so that's pretty much it. It's about, a, I guess, the overarching story 
is that they find um, a derelict ship that supposedly is full of you know precious metals and materials that you want gold and then it disappeared you know hundreds of years before and they find it and there was you know they find that there's something on it um and that's that's essentially the story the core story for that one and then the book from the, last year is supermind and it's one huge warning about how dangerous artificial artificial intelligence is that's the whole premise because you can't ever predict what a super intelligent artificial intelligence is going to do or be motivated by and i wanted to dig into that along with the social changes that come with advancing technology but isn't that you predicting it to an extent yeah i would consider it more like a fever dream of the future where you're you're trying to imagine one possible future but it's probably not going to be the actual future yeah type of thing. yeah just many many horrible uh, futures. Right. Uh, right. So people are noticing your your background here. Emil is asking about your sarcophagus. Making you, so you warned me in advance that you would have some interesting background. So can you, can you explain I, this? I have a very odd taste in decorating, and we're in what's essentially an archaeology room themed, and they're actually made out of fiberglass and they're CD cases. Um, so my music collection is hiding in them. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, but they're I you know I just have weird tastes. Uh, Curious Borg says, "Beware, Fraser, ruiner of all science fiction." <laughs> yeah, I, I there is a, <coughs> I think there is this sort of uh, as science explainers go, there's this journey that we take, and so we started in the beginning. We're like, "Oh my God, I want to talk about string theory and wormholes and warp drives and and all that." And then as you kind of make your way through the all of the actual science, the science just keeps kind of holding your feet and saying, no, 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 here's reality. And you sort of find this kind of happy medium in between the two. And yeah. so, yeah, I'm at, I'm definitely in the ruining sci-fi Christmas phase of my science explainery. Uh, Yvonne Laundry and George Lancaster, thank you so much for the donation. Uh, George wants to know, do you have any audible versions of the book? What I'm gonna do is there will be an audible version of Supermind, the newer book, read by me, mm -hmm. available. And then I'm going to read The Salvagers for free on a second YouTube channel. Oh, good. So anybody can get it in installments. It'll be the whole book, and it'll be me reading it for free. What are you going to put as the background? Is it going to be just like the book? I don't know. I haven't yeah. thought about that yet. You should do it as a may... podcast, right? So people can download it and listen to it while they're out and walking. And that stuff, I right? should, yeah. Well, I definitely will make a podcast yeah. version available. Um, yeah. But um, as to what the visuals would be, I have to think about that. I'm not sure because I have a huge archive of video I can use. So maybe yeah. I'll get interesting with it. Uh, what? Okay, Yvonne, you're asking a question no one ever take. When we move Big Interstellar 100 or Millennium or Never, I don't understand the question exactly. Are you talking about moving stars? How long will it take to move stars? Is that is that the question that you're asking? Maybe help us out. Uh, so okay, so please, we just keep getting distracted. Can you please explain octopus toast and whatever that other thing was before we move any further? I just made a joke at the end of my so. video. Yeah, I said we were going to talk about anything, and yeah. um, including octopus intelligence, toast. Okay. Right. Exo musks and anything anybody is is curious enough to ask a question about. We had an octopus in our uh, fish tank or the, in the aquarium here in Vancouver that was getting out every night and and pillaging other aquarium tanks and then sneaking back and he would climb cr crawl along the ground, sneak back into the tank and and nobody knew but but fish tanks were were losing fish and they finally had put up video to see what was going on and they could see the octopus jumping out traveling that's, around that's very unsettling <laughs> it really is <laughs> yeah yeah no nah, i won't eat octopus they're too smart yeah i won't eat anything that can pass the uh the mirror test i agree yeah, yeah i agree um so hit us with some questions we got we got we got him here for for like another 45 minutes okay okay so so well gravel pit says he wants to know how long it'll take for us to become interstellar as humans all right so when do you think we will become interstellar? The only thing I can think 
that we might do is something like um, Breakthrough Starshot, where we eventually send micro probes or something, um, or you know, a sail driven by laser, something yep. along those lines. I don't really envision this happening anytime within the next 10, 20 years, but maybe about 30 years, but it's going to take decades for it to get there. But what about actual people? Actual people is a, probably a very long way off. But do you think um, it will ever really happen? Eventually, but it could be centuries. Um, because, you, you know, first of all, you need to know what's there. Mm -hmm. And at this point in time, we really don't. I mean, we know that Proxima Centauri has a planet, but we don't really know that much about it. Um, so we're just in the infancy of being able to contemplate, um, you know, sub light speed travel. Um, so I would envision eventually we'll hollow out an asteroid and maybe create a ship. And if, you know, one, one game changer for this is that if you can extend the human lifespan to one or 2000 years, that changes the equation for interstellar travel and exploration because, you know, you don't, you no longer have a generational ship. It's just, mm -hmm. you're getting on the ship and you'll eventually get there. You just got to spend, you know, um, did, did you see that story that came out from the European space agency, like last week where they were like taking an asteroid and they had colonized an asteroid and then it had all these kind of bubbles off the back Ian over at uh, Astro Engine, Ian O'Neill did an article on this. And the idea is that you just, you take an asteroid that's moving in roughly the direction you want it to go, or you, you tweak the orbit so that it goes in the, in the direction that you, know, you give it escape velocity, but then you just feed off the asteroid for right, the duration right. of your journey, just turning more and more of the asteroid into the kinds of resources that, that you require. If you were really efficient, and I mean, if you use say a comet too, I mean, you would have plenty of water ice. Um, yeah, yeah. And then you know, water ice. You can, if you can get like bring a fusion reactor, you can, you know, turn that into breathable air and water and grow food and all sure. that kind of stuff. So yeah. yeah. Uh, Troll wants to know, John, what the heck is Tabby Star? I've seen multiple videos. What do you truly believe? I believe it's dust in some sort of a very strange juxtaposition, um, maybe a compound of two different phenomena going on that's causing very, very cold dust to uh, occlude the star's light. That's my gut feeling. And, yeah. But I've said that since the beginning, since I started covering it, that I thought that this was more than likely to be a natural explanation as opposed to alien megastructures. Um, if it is something alien, who knows? You know, it becomes aliens of the gap thinking where you, you know, move to whatever explanation. So for me, the simplest explanation is that this is just dust in a very, very strange uh, juxtaposition around the star. And that's what the scientists say too now. Yeah. Like it's not, your, you're not alone in this feeling about what it is. Right. Right. And it's now, at this point, they're very, they're fairly sure. Yeah. I know it's kind of, I know it's kind of, um, being a downer on it, but it's ruining I, I want to know Christmas. the truth yeah. about something, not, you know, yeah. wishful thinking. Yeah, well, and I mean, we always knew, and, and you had always said, right, we're, you know, it's not aliens. It's probably not aliens, but maybe. Right. Um, but maybe. But maybe. And, you know, one of these days, it may well be aliens, so, yeah. you know. Well, it's the same thing with Oumuamua, right? With sure. that, that interstellar asteroid. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that it was an asteroid that came from another star system is a fantastic and amazing thing to be able to detect. The chances that it's anything else is super remote, but they had to test. Super remote, but um, it's still about the most exciting thing I can think of. You know, where is this rock from? You yeah. know, why is it so elongated? Is it a big piece of iron, part of a former planet? So regardless, <laughs> I, I really hope we can inter intercept that one at some point. Yeah. And uh, there's a plan to do that. Um and see what it's like but from what i understand interstellar objects within the solar system are not rare so we'll and, have new chances for those yeah it's thought at any time there's thirty thousand of them in the solar system right so you know we just got to wait and find other ones yeah yeah there's um i covered on my channel there's actually two comets that have signs that they may have once been of uh, interstellar origin and they were just captured and we can go study those and see how they're different from comets that formed here, uh, if they're different at all. Uh, Neil Ujohn is asking your video on 234 stars with laser pulses. What came of that? Absolutely nothing. That was that came from a paper 
um, oh, about a year ago. And I forget who authored the paper, but they looked for um, laser signals in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And they had 234 detections. And the SETI community at the time said, well, not very likely. This is a one, not a 10. Um, but I have not heard a single thing about that paper since. No, neither have I. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the idea of what it could be is pretty exciting, right? That you could have like these gigantic space lasers that are accelerating huge starships up to significant portions of the speed of light to send them from, from world to world. And that's also sure. been one of the explanations that's been considered for these fast radio bursts. But... Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, the, the fast radio bursts, the uh, aliens firing up their Alcubierre warp drives and such. Yeah. Um, I am inclined, I'll, I'll entertain possibilities, of course, and it's, you know, speculation, but I'm inclined to believe that those are probably um, astrophysical in nature. Yeah. I mean, what explanation for fast radio bursts do you like the best so far? You no, know, I don't really have a favorite. Um, well, I, I, my favorite would be an alien warp drive. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> but, but that's what I'd like it to be, yeah. but I, I don't think that's what it is. Um, I think that it's probably a basket of causes, though, um, because there's differences between FRBs, and some of them repeat, some of them don't. Um, so my thinking is that it's just a basket of, of causes, maybe something to do with accretion disks of black holes or yeah. something along those lines. Some kind of pulsar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, William Johnson, your thoughts. Are we one of the first civilizations or is, all, is it all a simulation? So here we are. We, we, you know, we have to inevitably get to the Fermi paradox here. Uh -huh. Are we the first? I think um, we may not be the first, but my personal thinking is that intelligent life is probably very, very rare and that only a certain... Um, a certain series of events happens that will produce intelligent alien life like it happened here. And so many factors contributed to um, the rise of intelligence on Earth, such as, you know, plate tectonics and a moon and all this. That said, I think life is probably very common. I think we'll find microbes everywhere. And that's actually a more interesting question for me because you can ask the question, are we alone? But you may not get an answer for that within your lifetime. But if you ask the question, is life on Earth alone? You got a good chance of answering that, um, either through ice shell moons like Europa. Maybe there's something living there. Mm -hmm. Or independent of astronomy, the chemists, the biochemists are looking at, you know, what is it? What were the conditions that life arises? And eventually they're going to nail those and out comes a uh, microbe from the test tube. And then we can say, well, this is a fairly easy or it's fairly hard. If it's fairly easy, then it's probably everywhere in the universe. So that's the question I re have realistic expectations of answering is, is life on Earth alone? As far as intelligent life, I don't know. Um, but at the same time, if we did find it, I mean, would it be what everybody wants? Because we're going to know next to nothing about it, you know? Um, and, it, you know, things that we glean about this discovered civilization, should we ever find it, it's going to be decades in between anything. And all they're going to be able to say, say it came from radio astronomy, all they're going to be able to say is, we see a signal. And everybody's going to be like, well, what's it say? We don't know. Yeah. We just see a signal at a certain strength, at a certain frequency. But there are other techniques. You know, you've talked about Dyson spheres. You know, there have been right. fairly comprehensive surveys in search of Dyson spheres. And in fact, the sure. Gaia mission is, that's one of the things that it's going to be able to do as well. Mm -hmm. um, and other surveys have actually looked for type three civilizations, just like done infrared surveys of entire other galaxies. And so same thing, yep. none of that's turned up anything as well. So, you know, if there was a civilization in the process of colonizing this entire galaxy, and it would only need about a million years, 10 million years at the most to do it, we yep. would see them on the march. And if there had been other alien civilizations out there that had colonized their entire galaxies, again, we would see that. And yes. yet we don't see any of that. And we don't see any leftover archaeological material from them. We don't see their alien robots building monoliths on the moon. We just see stars, galaxies, as far as we can see. Seems pretty lonely. It does. Um, there's, there's just, so far, 
Now that could change. I mean, you know, we could see something and at some point, but, um, but it really doesn't look like it at this point, but we're early in the game. We're early in the game. Yeah. Um, once we get things like the, the LSST and these types of things that can give us a better, more real time view of the universe, we're going to see all kinds of strange yeah. stuff just yeah. like, you know, Tabby star and, and those stories. So, um, there'll be a lot more stuff to cover regarding the subject, but I think it's going to be a while before we really nail down an alien civilization, but it could, like you said, it could come from rather than radio. It could come from, you know, seeing CFCs in some exoplanet atmosphere or something, you know, really unnatural. Um, yeah. But you know, that's the fun of it is wait, wait and see. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm, for me, I'm on the we're first or we're alone because I don't want to consider the alternative which is, you know, that, that we're doomed. Right? <laughs> yeah. So that's my preference. My preference is we're first or we're alone and that life is rare and, or even unique. Well, I don't know that it's unique because we've got a whole lot of galaxies out there. So statistically it's probably still out there. It's just a very, very distant and we're, we're probably not likely to ever know about it. Yeah. If it's there and yeah. it'd be a good thing to find it. No, that, it could be a good thing that there's that there might be nothing else yeah, in yeah. the galaxy because it could you know it could say hello and be nice or it could be an aggressive yeah. machine intelligence right. bent on destroying all biology yeah berserkers yes uh Refirio and acro wants to know what's the next idea what will your next book be about i think uh i haven't really decided but i think i may try to explore um genetic modification and the future of um, human modification genetically, you know, will we grow wings or what are we going to do? Um, I think that's probably the direction I'll go. Don't know yet though. I mean, the, the, the interesting thing that I sort of think about is that, you know, when you go down the genetic modification route or you go down the AI route, both of those day after day are getting more and more capable putting the hands of sort of incredible, fairly dangerous technology in smaller and smaller groups. And we've seen, you know, when you give an idiot a gun, they will sometimes want to go out and shoot people and not have a very good rationale for it. When you give a person the ability to create a worldwide pandemic or a super intelligent AI, it feels like it's a question not if, but a question of matter of when. When will somebody get their hands on biologic you know make something dangerous they'll cook it up in their in their lab in their basement and release it you know that's the concern i have with both of those you know if someone asked me like how do we think we're going to go and in a question show and those are the two that feel most existential to me i agree um i tend to be hopeful though because at least so far we've had cloning technology for a very very long time yet no one's cloned a human so maybe there's some self-restraint there, but then again, there are people that, you know, might destroy civilization um, with one of these technologies eventually. But it is dangerous, definitely dangerous. Yeah, George Lancaster says, "I'm an A programmer, and we aren't close. They're alien. They, I mean, the thing is, is like an AI doesn't need to be like human intelligence. It just needs to be really, really good at doing." You know, it can be have a bug and do things very quickly and be dangerous. So, it doesn't have to be something that you can have a conversation with and and understand to to be dangerous. And same thing with a with a bio weapon. <laughs> um, Quadlibet says, if humans develop wings and we could fly, we would consider it an exercise and thus never do it. <laughs> It'd just be a matter of time. How long till you just wouldn't fly around because it was. You know, it was exercise and you're boring. Um, so John Jogers wants to know, are your plot ideas explorations of the implications of science findings that you see or is another source of your inspiration? I guess, I, and just with the amount of science that you're looking into now and the amount of research papers that you're writing, is that feeding you a lot of ideas now? It is. Um, oh, definitely it is. Um, and I write them down, you know, and then I eventually pick one. Yeah. But yeah, it definitely. Um, I always did research this stuff. I've been doing it, you know, for 30 some odd years. It's just now I'm doing something with that. Um, so I do a lot more research than I did before the channel. Um, 
but yes, it definitely plays in um, and sort of defines the ideas that I'm going to pursue most, most certainly. The two go hand in hand. The channel and the books go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. And that's the part that I – like I have – people always ask me if I'm going to run out of topics and I can't. Like I just have too many ideas. I, the sadness that I have is that I don't have enough time to get through all of the – ideas and content that I have because sometimes you want to do like a, you want to take your time you want to do a really good job of, of a topic and, then, and right. then I you know like I didn't do anything on the NASA insight mission yet yeah me neither um, I did watch the launch yeah um, but you know totally new Mars mission and uh, very yeah. exciting and it's going to answer some super interesting questions about the interior of Mars you know does it have any any sort of tectonic activity right now uh when did it shut down in the past you know that asks you know answers a lot of questions about where its magnetosphere went right uh the thing's going to be able to detect meteorites crashing into the surface of mars nearby it's absolutely fascinating so yeah hopefully we've got about six months oh and and paranor 001 is noting yeah insight and two cubesats first cubesats ever sent to another another planet which is amazing yeah it's 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 gonna be cool yeah yeah I, I'm, I'm excited for that mission but then again i'm excited for every mission right and then the parker solar pro but i got but i got that one under control i um <laughs> i i wrote my episode on the parker solar probe a couple you know like a year ago so right uh jim becker wants to know uh where do you get your inspiration and who do you follow on youtube so where do you get your inspiration from i know where you get your inspiration from inspiration comes from the topics, yeah. um, more or less. YouTube channels, who do I watch? Of course, Isaac Arthur, Fraser Kane, Paul M. Sutter. Um, I do watch Cody's Lab. Um, I watch, uh, it's sort of a family of channels, but the main one is called Periodic Videos, mm -hmm. and it's done yeah. by a chemist, um, or the chemistry department of, I think, Nottingham University. Um, I watch Vintage Space. I, I love that, mm -hmm. you know, sort of yeah. rocket history. Um, and then just a, a, quite a few more, um, but they're mainly like cooking shows and stuff. <laughs> yeah. I have a bunch <laughs> of video game shows. Yeah. 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 I know what you mean. I've got gardening shows and, and, and uh, yep. video shows. Uh, George Lancaster says we need to make a Universe Today CubeSat. Uh, well, actually, uh, there's a company that we reported on that is doing space telescopes, small CubeSat space telescopes that you'll be able to rent time on or maybe even get your own space telescope launched. So one of, we're uh, going to be bringing back the live telescope streaming. I'm actually going to run some tests tonight, but hopefully down the road we'll also get a space telescope, which is going to be crazy to be able to just like, like, hey, let's just look at some stuff in space. Maybe we can find those aliens. Uh, Referio and Acro wants to know, just in case I haven't been heard, what other hard sci-fi authors do you especially enjoy? So what other authors do you really like? Oh, my favorite would be Arthur C. Clarke, most definitely. Um, and I like a lot of them. I like uh, Asimov and Heinlein and, you know, the usual uh, classic ones. Um, let's see. I like Dan Simmons. I like uh, Hugh Howey. Uh, it's more of a newer I haven't author. haven't heard of him. He, yeah, he wrote a, a book series called Wool, sort of a dystopian science fiction, but it's very well done. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and of course, Andy Weir in The Martian. Yep. Fantastic book. Um, so yeah, I, I, I sort of, a mix of old and new, but lately I've been reading a lot of the very earliest science fiction, like John Campbell and um, even Mary Shelley. I, I went wow. back and reread uh, Frankenstein. So. so I just float around. I went through a Werner Vinge binge. Vingy? Vinge? I'm not how I'm not sure how, yeah, how that's pronounced. Yeah. yeah, and I did go through an Arthur C. Clarke binge, and I went back and reread all of the Foundation books, which I I think are one of my favorites, especially the, the I mean the the sort of the, by the third one where the sort of the the mule kind of gets sort of caused a big impact in the in the world. It's a but it's, a, it's such a great idea. I really I really enjoy that. I sort of so much about the internet predicted in advance. Um, I love the, the foundation. So man, there's so much stuff. I, again, I, it's like, I don't have time of time to read. I get, I've got, I have books piling up and I just don't have time to read, which is too bad. Yes. Yeah, same here. And it's, uh, somebody mentioned Frank Herbert. Yes. I love Frank yeah. Herbert. Um, but the, um, 
the uh yeah the, there's not enough time in the day because there's uh, so much science fiction that's been written over the years yeah and it's not just the novels you know they're the short stories there are just so many of them that you probably couldn't read them all in a lifetime oh people are now throwing in all of their stuff bradbury bear mm. Bryn, baxter benford strauss finge uh Liu Six Sixin Sixin? I don't know how to say oh, it. Yeah, that was another good one. Yeah, the three body problem. I read that I read that this year as well. Uh I've really got to do a um I did the 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 Bobiverse. I gotta do like a Goodreads list and then just throw them in there and then because people ask me this question all the time. I'm like, I don't remember. You know. There was like this summer that I had when I was a kid and I just I had a list of had a book and I read every book that I read over the summer and I wrote down the the titles and I think I made it through like 70 books over the course of my summer break like sometimes I was reading two in a day so right I, I don't I wish I had that kind of time John Varley yeah, Spider too. Robinson yeah Pratchett hey Francisco Juarez wants to know what strategies do you use to avoid MacGuffins and deus ex machina moments in your plots um, I don't know that I have a technique. I just know what they are and I avoid them. <laughs> um, just be very careful not to get into sort of, um, shortcuts. Uh, but I can tell you one thing I do, um, definitely is that if I, if I'm going to write a story, I, I already have an ending. I start with an ending mm -hmm. and I work towards that. Um, and then it'll play like, like I said earlier, it'll play like a movie in my head and I just write it down. But if I don't have an ending, don't even I don't even bother to write it because that's where you start getting into the needs for MacGuffins and yeah. you know, just ex machina because you paint yourself into a corner that way. Yeah. So well, I've heard people you... write their books backwards sometimes. Like you plot out your book yeah. backwards, mm -hmm. and so you know what the final outcome is, and then you do the the stage before that, and then the stage before that. But oh, I... somebody just mentioned another great sci-fi author that doesn't get enough attention: Stanislav Lem. Very excellent. I haven't. What that. What did he write? I haven't read. Uh, well, let's see. What was the one that I read uh, recently? Um, this was. I mean, he's he's been gone a long time. I think he was active mainly in the forties and okay, 50s. okay, old school. Um, God, I can't remember the title. Arjun asks, "Do you think sci-fi today doesn't bring up any new technology? Just the stuff that's up and coming?" Um. So far, just the stuff that's up and coming, but. I can envision um, far future technologies. So I probably write something about it at some point, but my books so far have just been set, you know, 50 years in the future, maybe 400 years in the future for the first one. But one of these days I'll, I'll write one where it's, you know, 5,000 or 10,000 years in the future. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. Yeah. It, but I mean, it's so hard to think about those kind of implications. I mean, the, you know, the, the, this idea of the singularity sort of, the whole point of the singularity is that it's like a brick wall of that you can't see what's on the other side of it, right? If we get to a point where we merge it, with our computers and the super intelligent computers take over, then we just we can't right. predict anymore. You, yeah, it becomes incomprehensible. But at the same time, um, the way to write that stuff is to assume that the singularity doesn't happen and it's only partial, <laughs> and that's people reject some of that stuff that could happen. Um, for example, people don't want to um, transcend into a nanotechnological cloud or something like that. They decide, well, no, I, I don't want to do that. But, but I do want, um, you know, to be a cyborg or something like that. That's how you have to handle that because if you go full singularity, good luck predicting it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, John Jogers wants to know how much do you try to justify the science in your stories? Or are you just working on internal consistency? Initially, it was internal consistency, but the science goes along with it. There are a few mistakes in the first book because I wasn't really shooting for that. Um, but everything else, yeah, is pretty consistent, hard sci-fi. And from this point on, it's definitely going to be hard sci-fi. I, I mean, are you up to date on The Expanse? No, you know what? I've been saving The Expanse um, mm. to binge watch. And that's how I do it. So new television, I, I don't get to see it until about six months after when I have the whole season or the whole, yeah. you know, whatever's done so far so that I can jump in and just binge watch it over a weekend. So I've not yet gotten to The Expanse. Yeah. I so, so, I mean, so you haven't seen any of them yet then? No, I haven't seen oh, any man. of them yet. Okay. All right. So they're on, uh, they're on Amazon Prime though. So I have access. Uh, yeah. So season three though, which, which probably aren't, but it is like 
they have a couple of scenes where they do proper acceleration and G forces and and I like I just couldn't believe I, I I was like it was an incredibly thrilling scene with sort of a situation happening that could only happen because you know we obey the laws of Newtonian physics in this spaceship and and it was like they it was as thrilling as any sci-fi show that I've ever seen and yet it was you know scientifically essentially correct you know right you know they were i knew where they were trying to go with it and i appreciated it so you can really see like i think that that not only did they tell something that was scientifically correct but they told something that was as thrilling or more thrilling than something that was unscientifically correct because they thought through the right. consequences of of what would happen in this situation and those consequences were harrowing so i uh i sort of wrote a enthusiastic i nerded out at the at the writers saying like you guys just absolutely killed it did such a good job so um let's see let's get on with some more questions uh alan Hinton <laughs> wants to know would you ever co-write with isaac arthur <clears throat> you have i mean you've done you've done collaboration yeah. with them right? yeah we did one collaboration and i suppose i can hint that there may yet be another collaboration coming <laughs> um as far as writing fiction, no, not really. Um, yeah. But writing scripts, definitely. We, you know, yeah. we're, we've done it once, and yep. you know, he's um, he's a, he's a lot of fun to write with, and it's same with you. Actually, it was a lot of fun to write with you. Um, it, you know, you want somebody who sort of keeps up the pace, and you know, Isaac Arthur writes so fast, it's stunning. And you know, you yeah. you were a very fast writer. I like to think I'm a very fast writer, so it was really nice to be able to to kind of work with somebody where you're like, let's work on this thing. Okay, great, it's all done. You've done your part. Yep, my part's done. Okay, let's go. Yep. And and Isaac yeah. is a he's a machine, which is great. And especially when you look at the length of his script, right? He, he puts out thirty plus minute episodes on a weekly mm -hmm. basis and edits them. I don't understand. And I keeps the election trains running on time. I, yeah, I don't know. I, I couldn't do it. A lot of people are always on me saying, do longer content, yeah. do longer content. Well, you know, to do one of those five minute videos takes a day, you know, and to do a 30 minute video is going to take me probably two weeks, you know, yeah. um, because of the, everything that goes into it. So I do some longer content, but it's, it's hard when it's scripted. Now, if you're just talking to somebody like this, it's easy. Yeah, no, I know. But, uh, that's why, that's why I've, I've been yeah. incorporating these. Well, I mean, I've been incorporating these because, you know, a lot of people really enjoy the QA aspect and I, you know, I want to be able to give people connections because I know like for you and even Isaac Arthur and even Cody, I don't think Cody had ever done a live interview, had never been anywhere Thrilled. that people could sort of see him and talk to him. And I, I can't think of times that, you know, I think you've been on some podcasts, but I don't know if people have been able to have a direct connection to you. So uh, I think this is an, another fun medium. But I know that people would would not let me not make the guide to space videos as well, right? I can't not do that as well. So I they all right. have to be additive, right? That's all. Right. Yeah. It's just you know, add never never subtract. Uh, Dustin King, well, how did your process change? Oh, how did your process while collaborating differ from when you write alone? So how how is your collaboration process different from how you write alone? It's it's it, it's it's different. Um, when I write alone, I'm pretty much just pounding out um, stream of thought. Uh, you know, that's that's it just comes out of my head. Whereas if it's collaborating, you know, like what we did, you know, I start with we start with notes mm -hmm. and points, and then you write and fill in, and um, that's that's essentially how it works. And it like I said, it it goes really fast with with um, actually everyone I've collaborated with, it's, it's a very fast process. Yeah. For me, um, it all comes down to the level of trust, right? If the writing partner trusts in your ability to do your part of the work, then it goes very quickly because, and if, if people don't have a lot of ego in the game, you know, so yep. like I find like we did a, a, one collaboration that I did with Isaac Arthur, we put a real theme to it. And he ended up putting a lot more of the text into it, but I ended up putting a lot more of the, of the sort of the atmosphere into it and sort of the way the writing style was and sort of rewrote his work. And so he'd put 
all a lot of the concepts in and then i sort of gave it a singular narrative and he was like yeah whatever do it man i don't care right like he just you know he doesn't he doesn't have a lot of ego invested in what that what you know as long as it's not garbage he was happy with what the outcome was and i think that's the key right is I think so, if yeah. you don't have any ego invested as long as you know what the other person is doing is not garbage then then it works really fine and i think it's when people get too much ego invested that's yeah. when it bogs down and gets really gross and that's one thing you definitely have to do is is you know check your ego um if you're going to do this youtube thing it's just you know don't don't take yourself too seriously um steven angus says do you ever get on a roll with your writing Oh yes. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it's yeah, it goes crazy. Sometimes, um, and sometimes it goes slow. Um, it's easy for the channel because I'm usually writing about something that I'm interested in researching at that time or a news story. But as far as the books go, it it it's, it either goes smoothly and fast or it doesn't go at all, and then I just go make YouTube videos. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, like this is the thing about being a writer, which is, and anyone who wants to write, I mean, writers write. My my daughter is wanting to be a a, a writer now, and she's she's doing great. She's written a bunch of a bunch of short stories. It's working on a book right now, and I'm trying to you know I explain this this sort of concept to her, which is like there's no such thing as plumber's block. I guess maybe there is, but um you know you plumber's plumb and writer's write, and mm -hmm. you have to just sit down and do the work and whatever tool it takes. And if you want to be a writer but you don't find yourself writing then you probably don't want to be a writer exactly yeah. right if you, it only write if you like it um, yeah 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 don't no. write because you want to have written right because you enjoy the writing um yeah and and so you just you know you sit down in front of the screen and you and if it's garbage it's garbage too bad right you're sure. making you're you're doing a bad job but more often than not you're writing garbage and then suddenly you pull something together and you're like oh this is actually really good oh I'm really having a riot. And then you realize four hours have gone by, you're starving and you've written some <laughs> stuff that you're really happy with. And that the, I find the, comes up more often than, than not. Right. It's the, it's the writer's trance. Yeah. It hits you yeah. And you lose all connection with, with time. And then all of a sudden you look up and five hours has, has passed and you've got, you know, thousands of words written. So yeah, I, I know that feeling very well. Yeah. And that you're not, necessarily going to enjoy it right like it's a job right. it's a job it's like yep. if you are washing dishes or if you're digging ditches or if you're building a house i mean whatever it is there's going to be times when you enjoy your work and there's going to be times when you don't and too bad you pick the career right yep. yeah, exactly <laughs> and yeah. so do yep. the work and yep. and and that's it and that's it mm -hmm. um ray bradbury says write ten thousand words every day that's a good good, good point how how many how many words a day do you write well, fiction-wise, it'd be about two thousand, and then not all of it's good. Um, <laughs> and then, God, whatever the length of my average YouTube script would be, um, which is probably maybe five hundred to a thousand at most. Yeah. Um, so I write about two to three thousand, maybe four thousand words yeah. a day. Yeah. Yeah, I'm about the same. I'm about five. I write about five k words a day if yeah. I'm writing. And, you know, right. a lot of the times I'm doing a lot of other stuff. Sure. And, yep. you know, that's, I don't, I, don't, I, I can't imagine 10,000 though. Like I write fast and I can write for a long time. I can't, but I can't understand how he can do 10,000 words a day. That would be 12, 14 hours for me if I tried that. Yeah. And, and the quality would suffer towards the last five hours. Um, yeah. But even but for I, like a thousand words, like if you can write a thousand words a day, Right. That is you releasing a novel every three months. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, I, I tend to think of it more in terms not of so much as how I, how much I write, but rather how long I've written. And I don't really feel good if I haven't written for six hours a day. Um, so if I got that six hours in, whether it's YouTube scripts or whatever, then I'm pretty happy. And then I move on to video editing or um, research, you know. But um, But yeah, about six hours of writing a day is what I do. Yeah. Uh, oh, Damien Reload is saying, sorry, he said 1,000. There you go, 1,000 words a day. Yeah, I write seven words a day. I write seven words a day. So he writes, so he says write 1,000 words a day. Yeah, so 1,000 words a day is enough to write, is enough to publish a couple of novels a year, which, right. you know, is more often than most people, so. Sure. 
Um, Sign of Junkie wants to know what you think of the Halo universe. Have you Halo? I um, I don't have a huge amount of experience with it to be honest. Um, I liked what I saw, but the universe that I really like, as far as the video games go, is uh, the Mass Effect universe. Mm-hmm. Um, I found the sci-fi there to be pretty compelling. Did you finish the games? I've not finished three, but I have finished one and two. Oh, you should totally finish three. It's oh, I will. The, it's I the will. best of the bunch. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, man, the Mass Effect games are the gold star for dealing with science fiction concepts in a video game setting. I yeah. I what really I, I started to see how they how they described the planets that you would visit, um, you know, or you would mine or whatever you would do. And I'm starting to see stuff that was plausible. And I was like, oh, this is good. You know? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've been I've been pretty compelled with that one. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh Don Archangel, what do you what are your thoughts on using a voice recorder for writing? I have done it in the past, actually. Um it's good if you're if you don't have um if you're like driving a car or something, it would be really good. Um, but I don't really do that because I if I'm distracted, then I'm pulled out of that zone. Um, so I, I just tend to prefer to type and do it that way. But for some people, a voice recorder would definitely, you know, help out a lot, especially if you have like a long commute time, you know, for work and you want to get a book out, you know, and start a writing career. That would be one way to do it while you're sitting in traffic. Yeah. 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 I couldn't do it either, but, but it could just be that I'm a product of the, of when I grew up, right. Just, Typing, right. typing, typing. So maybe it's good. I don't same know. here. Yeah, same here. I mean, I'm, what? I think I'm 42. So Cody is watching. He says, for comparison, I write nothing for months and then crank out 20 key words overnight. Yeah, but see, that's not sustainable, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, Carlos Diaz wants to know what's your opinion of the practicality of the Alcubierre warp drive. Oh, uh, I don't think we know enough yet about it to say that it. See, the the problem with this type of stuff is you. It always seems to need some sort of an exotic matter or yeah. something like that, like, um, you know, something with negative mass or something like that to work. And until we know that we can actually make that stuff or if it physically exists in the universe, then it just seems like pie in the sky to me. And, of course, there are other issues, you know, radiation issues and things with the Alcubierre drive. But I don't count it out, you know, maybe. It's a speculative technology. But I think in practice, we're going to find it's pretty hard to make, just like traversing a wormhole would be. You know, you just yeah. need these weird forms of matter that we don't know if they're there or not. Uh, Paranoid says uh, exotic matter equals MacGuffin. Yeah, it's like this <laughs> MacGuffin, like, like we want our science fiction to have faster-than-light transportation. We want artificial gravity. We want transportation we want turbo lasers we want vulcan neck pinches and we want stargates and the problem is that each of those probably mostly except for violate the laws of physics and biology um so it's it's too bad now i actually uh i've got an interview coming up with ethan siegel that i did we're going to talk about the nature of space time and when I get my warp drive. And he brings up the same point, which is, you know, all we're waiting for is that negative universe. We get the negative, right. we get the sort of, we get that negative matter. We get the negative matter. And then that starts to unlock a lot of things like the Alcubierre warp drive. Um, right. right. And one of the sort of maybe possibilities is that antimatter has negative gravity. So right. it could be that, you know, if you drop a chunk of, of antimatter, it will float upwards. But the problem is it's so volatile that nobody has ever, you know, nobody's ever been able to detect it. So that's still right. an unknown. And if it turns yeah. out that it is, then great. We get to have a warp drive. And if not, well, sorry. Right. You yep. know, use yep. the star shot. Nancy Graziano wants to know, how difficult is it to develop a plot? Do you ever worry that your plot is subconsciously building on a plot that you read from other authors? Oh, you always obsess about that, um, that you're copying something that you read 30 years before and you just don't remember reading it. But the truth is you just have to write it. And people will tell you if, you'd, <laughs> if you've copied something. Um, and so far that hasn't happened to yeah. me. So, so I got no, I don't yelled think so. at because – the scripts of my video were word for word this article that someone had read on universe today 
<laughs> they didn't quite make the connection. They didn't make the connection, yeah. I'm like, yeah, because I wrote it. <laughs> and I published the website. So. See the name? <laughs> <laughs> See the name? Yeah. Yeah. So that was, uh, yeah. But I, I know what you mean that you, man, and we probably over obsess about it that there are no real original ideas, right? No, it's just like music. There's only a certain number of notes, you know, and then it repeats. Yeah. Um, so, the, yeah, it's it's just, you know, you, you do your best to make a, a unique plot. Uh, Fortune Ninja, if we found a Stargate in real life and got it working, would you go through given the opportunity? As long as it had a good track record of not killing people. Yeah. That's sort of like I am. People ask me if I want to go to Mars on Elon Musk's BFR. Well, let, let's see how, how, how reliable it is first. Yeah. Yeah, the Stargate is the only one that I will take. You know, like, that's the one I want. Now, I mean, each one of them seems to go to another version of British Columbia, which is where <laughs> I already live. So I feel like I'm walking through Stargates all the time already. But... Um, but yeah, I mean, that is the most effortless method of travel across the stars that I can envision, right? You you just walk up a little ramp, you go through a bubbly stargate, and you appear on another planet far, far away. That's awesome. Done. Sold. Yes, please. I will take that. Uh, let's get some more questions. Krishnan's saying that antimatter doesn't have negative gravity. It's proven. I'm not sure that's true. But like I said, I just talked to a PhD particle physicist like last week, and he offered up the uh, the possibility. In his new book, this isn't your new book, but his book, Technology, The Science of Star Trek. So it uh, holds out a little hope that we'll be able to get a warp drive. Well, we're just getting to the end of this hour, so we should probably wrap things up. Uh, where can people who have like no idea who you are, um, where can people find out more? Well, there's my YouTube channel, um, John Michael Godier, and then just search my name on Amazon, and the books will come up. Pull, hold them up um, again. And Let's see the books again. Huh? Books uh, again. You know what? I threw. I may let me grab them. I may oh. have thrown them a bit too far. I tend to I tend to throw things. I can't uh, I can't help it. <laughs> All right, there's two books. Awesome. And um, they're available on Amazon, and both ebook and paper format. And then, um, I, of course, I, I Twitter. I'm at Jam Godier, and then um, Facebook and, and the usual places. Yeah. Uh, and what topic are you working on right now? What what ideas are people going to see in the next coming weeks? I am trying to think about what we could say and speculate about alien physiology. Say we saw a an intelligent alien. What clues do we have here on Earth that might suggest what it might be like? That's that's the big project. Um, and then you know. Um, I think I'll have another video in about a day about another Fermi paradox um, solution. And as well. what's the the video that you're working on and you just can't get it finished? That's stuck in limbo. It's that one, the the one on in trying to envision yeah. alien life because you know there are certain things that you know, like for example, our biped locomotion is entirely accidental. It's it's a trick of evolution, just coming from you know, um, a species with four legs. But that only the only reason for that is because we come from a fish that had four fins that were suitable. So you can't apply things like that to what aliens would look like. But you can look at you know things like fish. Well, fish are pretty good in water, you know. So maybe some sort of analog of fish exists. So it's it's sort of digging in that. But there's so much. Um, there's that. And then I also have a script on Kirill life that has been plaguing me for a long time because certain things with the biochemistry and, you know, I just need to do a lot of research before I make that video. Like, like so. other, the other chirality, like, like yes. right-handed versus left-handed. Right. And Asking we, the question, could, could we see like go to an alien world and yeah. see opposite life, you know, something like that. 
Awesome. All right. Well, we're up the end of the hour. John Michael Godier, thank you so much for joining me. Definitely check out his YouTube channel. Check out his books. Uh, man, you should come back sometime, and uh, we'll be, tackle a whole bunch more questions. I really appreciate it, man. All right. Yep. Thanks. Thanks. It was a blast for you. Thanks, everybody. See you later.